Hello, good day, and welcome back. So today, we're going to be starting a new chapter, chapter 12. And this chapter, we're going to really be taking a tour of several other packages that we haven't covered so far. And the reason for that is, is that we really can continue going one chapter per package. That was going to take us a very long time. The other thing is that now you're more comfortable with the concept and the idea um, and things like um, objects and their methods. So it's much easier to just sort of point you to a chapter, do a little intro, and then you can figure out the rest because there are tons of examples. And again, um, you've sort of seen it before. All right. So we're going to start off here by looking at in this for section for chapter 12, we're going to look at the formatted package FMT and specifically at the print related functions. So even though we're doing a tour of packages in this chapter, some chapter packages might require one or two videos. We'll see. OK, so we're going to look at print, print line, printf, f printf, f print, scanf. And what we're going to do is instead of me trying to just show you the documentation how to use it, I'll try and actually implement some of these functions just to let you see how it might come about. And then that gives you sort of a feel for what it's really trying to do. And then hopefully, um, you know, you can better understand how to use it. Does that make sense? All right, let's just jump in. So let's take a look. Um, at the package itself in the documentation. As it says, is FMT implement formatted IO and basically is derived from the C or inspired by C um, related printf and scanf function. If you don't know C, don't worry, but once we cover C, sometime if you stick with me and you do C, you're gonna see where these things come from. But of course, C doesn't have all of these, what they call verbs here, but in C we call them format specifiers. And so what we're gonna do is we are going to focus more on the functions. Um, there's some interfaces defined here, and you can see the stringer interface is actually um, an interface that we've used already and implemented with the string method. Um, but we're not going to worry with that. We're going to spend our time just looking at the, some of the functions. And this first section of the video, we're going to focus on the print related functions. And then in um, the next section, we're going to look at the scan related function. So typical thing, we're going to speed up here through the magic of editing, and we're going to write some code. And then we're going to start off by looking at another way of printing out this information, right? And we know that oh, this is essentially just using the, we could use write string on the standard IO and variable, uh, which represents the output to your display. And that works is equally well. So no surprise here. The next thing that would be really nice to do is to be able to say, what if we just wrap print right into the output standard out into a function? So we can call that function print lin. And of course, this is incorrect. If we call print lin, then it should be adding the last new line for us. We shouldn't be adding it. Um, and so we're going to refactor this into a two functions, one that you know, adds the new line for us and one that prints without adding a new line. So we can call it print and then print lane. And of course, print lane is going to call print and then add in the new line before it calls print. Now, what if we wanted to pass multiple arguments? So we want to pass multiple strings and maybe integer values. So obviously this print lane and print that we have now wouldn't work. So we need to make it accept different types of parameter. We've done this before. We just need to write it as a variadic function. And we, when we talk about interfaces, we know how we can make a variadic function, which means multiple parameters of the same type. And if that type is in, in the empty interface, well, we can pass just about anything to it. So that is exactly what we're going to do. So one of the other things we have to do is handle the fact that we have different types of values that are going to be provided for us. Remember, when they're as um, interface type, that's just the dynamic. That's just the dynamic type, but we have the underlying type, and so we need to sort of um, do type assertion to figure out what is the actual type, and then we use that special switch on type to figure out well is the underlying type a string or an int in this case, and then if it's default, we don't. It's not one of those two. Well, we're not going to handle it right now. We're just going to sort of put a, a placeholder. Now, um, if it's an int, we need to convert that integer 
to a string. So now we have to implement our i to to a function, which is integer to ASCII, is our old name. And again, don't worry about it. That's what we're gonna call it, i to a instead of i to s for string. But that's what we're gonna do. So let's implement that function. All right. So the implementation of i to a is pretty straightforward in a sense. We're going to accept an integer, and then we're going to take the integer, divide it repeatedly by 10. Repeat, divide it repeatedly by 10 makes it smaller and smaller, of course. But one of the um, operators we have um, in the language and in math is the modulus operator, which is that percent sign. And so if we divide by, use the modular operator, we're gonna have the remainder. So let's take the number 35, for example. If I take the modulus of 10, what I get is the remainder when you divide that number by 35 by 10, which can give you five. So if the remainder is stored in R as an integer of five, then I can use that to look up what's the string representation of that number five. And since my slice of string is indexed from 0 to 9, well, whatever my remainder is, I just look it up and I get the corresponding strings. If my remainder is 0, I get the, the string 0. If my remainder is 5, I get a string 5. And so all I need to do now is keep adding that on to a string and build it up. Now, if you see the problem, don't worry, we'll get back to that. The, the thing I did first also is to check and see if this is a negative number. If int is a negative number, the string representation need to have a minus in front of it. So we're going to take care of that. And then now we could run our code and see what this look like. Okay, so if we run, we run our code, we'll see that oh, we're getting 53 instead of 35. And this is obviously wrong. And the reason why is because we're appending um, um, the numbers. And so when we divide by 5, we, we append that to s. And then we append 3. We need to prepend it. But we can't just use s. We have to use a different um, variable, so we use t. And then if we test with negative, we see that oh, there's a problem. Um, we don't get anything other than a dash. And so what we need to do is multiply i by 1. And the reason why is when i is negative, because of our loop was set up, it never entered the loop. So now we fix both problem and retest it with a negative number and with 35, a positive number. And we see that oh, it looks correct. So now. We can go and start looking at what does it mean if we try to use different, more um, different types in um, other types, sorry, in our um, print line, like for example, a float. What does that look like when we use a float? And we could see we, we have in our code that our, our switch statement there that it's just unknown. But if we actually went in and tried to handle a float, we'd have to write another function that takes a float and convert it to a string. Now, I'm not saying this is a trivial function, but at least we know that oh, there must be some way in which you can take a float and convert it to a string. We're not going to do, do it because that's not the point of this exercise. The point of this exercise is I'll show you how we can build up things and why we have something like the formatted IO package to make life simpler for you so you don't have to write something like this. Okay, so this is good, but what if we, right now we're just writing to standard out specifically. What if we just wanted to write to anything that is a writer? Remember, standard out is a writer. So what if we wanted to write to a file, for example, use our formatting things to write to a file. So in that case, we're gonna have an fprint um, function, an fprint line function. And what they do is they take a writer as the IO writer specifically as the first parameter, and then all the variadic parameters after. And so now, we can just make our f um, our print len function call the f print one, but they specify that they want to use you know um, OS that standard out because they're just delegating to the more generalized one that writes to a file, and then now we just have to move most of our logic into this f print function and have it do all the work. But now it's going to use IO that writes string to write to the writer. Because remember, even though the writer interface itself doesn't, IO writer interface doesn't have write string, but the IO package has this function called write string, which takes a string and writes it to a writer, to IO writer. So that's all we're doing. And now when we retest, um, everything should work the same. We haven't done anything spectacularly new, except we've given ourselves the ability to say, we're generalizing where we're writing to, to any writer, instead of specifically writing to standard out as we were doing before. All right, so one of the things that we can do when we retest is we can see that oh, 
everything still works. The other thing we might want to do is say, well, you know, this is nice and dandy how we pass in, pass in a number of parameters. But what if we wanted to pass a formatted string? So like in the form of what we've seen before with print F, where you can put these format specifiers or what in Go they call verbs that says that's a percent %s, percent %f, percent %d, percent %v, and so on. They call them those verbs. But in C, I'll call them format specifier or verbs, whatever. And so we want a formatted string like I have on line 14 there. And it's going to say, well, the string I wanted to be, I want to print out at the end or the result I want to have is that the, where you see percent s, percent s, I want the value of name to be substituted there. And where you see percent that 2f, I want the value, the next parameter that I have after name um, variable, which is the 5.3, I want that just to appear there. So notice how this is a sort of easier and more straightforward. So line 13 and line 14 should have the same result, except that line 14 look a little bit easier to understand and digest because you read it and just note how something have to be filled in and then afterwards you can see what those things are. So this is a formatted string and this where the f come from from the print function where we have print f. And so what does it take for us to write this? So let's go ahead and write a print f function. And what we're gonna do is we're going to delegate the work to some magical function called sprintf. The s in front stands for string printf, which means that this function takes the format specifier, the formatted um, specification with the variadic var all those variables, and it tries to create a string that represent the output that you want, and it returns a string. Now, if we can write this function, then all the other functions that all the printf type functions could just delegate to this. So our printf, and we could even write a f printf, and they just call s printf s printf to do all the work. And so here's a very simple first step at implementing s printf. Imagine that for the formatted string, we just walk through it. Right? So we're going to range over format and we're going to look for anything. Uh, all, each character, visit each character. Now, if the character does, is not a percent, we just copy it, back, copy it back to our output, which is R. Okay? And if it's a percent, then we know it, it, it represents a verb or it comes before a verb. So in that case, we, we have to do some special handling. And how we handle it is going to depend on which verb we're, we're talking about. In our example, is the verb the um, S or is the verb, you know, F, we will see. So when we print this out, it looks like um, we sort of not substituting anything in. We're removing the verb yes and copying, copying stuff out to the output. We remove the percent for sure, but we still have the verbs there. So we need to take care of those also. And so if we go back to our code now and we say, well, okay, what does it mean when we see a percent? We have to handle this. So we're going to switch on what the verb is next. And so how do we know what comes after the percent? Well, it's the very next character. So that's why on line 22, we can say format of i plus 1. Now remember, i is the variable that's being used to loop over um, thing. The other thing we need to know do is every time we meet we reach a verb or we process a verb, we have to know which one of the variables we're using from that, you know, from values. So remember the variables in a variadic function shows up as a slice of interface. So the first time offset is zero because we haven't processed any yet. And then after we finish processing um, the percent %s, for example, that's the first one we need to process. We're going to increment offset. So the next time we see a next percent, it's going to point to the very next um, value that we need to process. So in this example, we're going to update our string so that it now um, has a percent %d, because we already have a function that handles percent %d. And anything else that we don't understand besides percent %s and %d, we're going to say it's unhandled for now. And then we're just going to come back and revisit how to handle that later. So if we go back now, run our code, we'll see that our Jane shows up, but there's an S there. And so that tells us that we need to remove the verb from the output. So the way we're gonna do this is we're not gonna use a range over the format. Instead, we're gonna use a for loop with I 
going over the length of it, which almost, is almost the same thing, except but what it allows us to do is control I. And so now we can, if we use range, it visit literally every character. But if we use a, our own variable I, I, we can say when to skip a character, right? Because the for loop is going to be checking the value of I. So if we increment I within the for loop, guess what? The result is going to be that it skip over. So we can see that we're skipping over there um, on line 31. And that's because once we come into this case statement at 20, when we see a percent, we try and figure out which um, verb was specified after the percent, and then we skip over it. And then now we can continue um, processing and we can see when we run our code, it behaves exactly like we expect, where we have Jane is 35 years old and that looks pretty good. So if we clear our screen and we run it, we run it, it looks good and substitute in the decimal. The only one we're not handling, of course, is the float. But again, we said that's a little bit more difficult, so we're not going to focus on that. Okay, so we can go back to our code and start handling even more cases. You know, we can say, okay, what if the thing that comes after the percent is a period or it's a number, like a decimal? You know, we have to eat that up and keep track of what does that mean um, in terms of the width and all this other stuff. So we're not going to actually do it like we said. Instead, what we're going to do is say, okay, what if we were to take our code, all this code that we've written, and sort of package it up into a, put it in that package, right? Yes, package it up. And so that's what we're going to do now. We're going to work on moving all this code that we've written so far and putting it into its own package. And then we're going to use that package. Now, we're not going to use this as a substitute for the FMT um, package. We're just showing it out if we had to take it and organize things. So again, we've done this before when we work with like person and in chapter 10, I think it was, we were working with person and our mem store, we had them in packages. And it was basically a directory, a subdirectory within our code directory, and we created individual files for different functions. It's just easier to, to manage that way. The nice thing we're going to see is that each one of these functions are going to be really small, like just three or four lines. And the majority of the work is going to be inside of the sprintf um, that go file. And that's because that's the file that's doing all this heavy lifting of turning a formatted string into a string, a formatted string with variables as it using because of a variadic function. And then turn it into a string and then all the other functions use it. So when we test there, we well, want some of our file did not update and import um, necessary packages that they need. But right now, our F package only depends on OS that um, stand it out and the IO package. It doesn't use FMT itself. And so we can say that we have somewhat of a low representation of FMT package, right? All right. So that's pretty much it in terms of being able to encapsulate what was the gist of the formatted package. Now, this is only the print side of formatted IO. We have IO means input and output, right? So we really did just formatted O. Um, in the next um, section, we're going to look at the scanf functions, which deals with how do you read input. And we've seen that already. We've written a function that scans standard in and take everything regardless of number, int, or whatever, and just return that to us. Um, and so we're not going to try and do the same thing there that we did here, which is to try and basically re-implement um, sprintf or anything like that. We're just going to jump right into start playing with it. And so that's going to be in the next video. So that's it for this video. Thanks for your time as usual. Appreciate it. Thumbs up the video if you like what you're seeing. Subscribe if you like what you're seeing and you haven't subscribed yet. And certainly spread the word if you like it and you want to share it with others. I would certainly hope that you would do that. So take care. See you in the next video.